Good evening, everybody. I'm Shona Barrett, Head of Audience Engagement at State Library Victoria, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Fellowships Programme Information Evening. State Library Victoria acknowledges the traditional lands of all the Victorian Aboriginal clans and their cultural practices and knowledge systems. We recognise that our collections hold traditional cultural knowledge belonging to Indigenous communities in Victoria and around the country. We support communities to protect the integrity of this information gathered from their ancestors in the colonial period. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, who have handed down these systems of practice to each new generation for millennia. I'd like to give a very warm welcome to you all, to our generous fellowship partners, to current and former fellows, to our Auslan interpreters from Auslan Stage Left, to selection panellists, and most importantly, those of you who are here tonight who are interested in applying for a fellowship. I'd also like to acknowledge Maxine Briggs, Curie Librarian at the State Library. Maxine is unfortunately unable to join us this evening due to internet problems, but we will talk a little bit about the Indigenous Victorian Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Research Fellowships today, and also give you information about a separate information session for those fellowships, which Maxine will host. So we're here tonight to provide you with some information and helpful tips, and to give you a forum to meet some of the team and to ask us questions. The format for tonight's session will be as follows. My colleague Susie, Susie Gasper, a producer at the library, will talk through some of the important dates and talk about some of the library's fellowships and the criteria associated with applying for those fellowships. Joe Tui, Executive Director and CEO at Regional Arts Victoria, will join me in a mini conversation about our regional engagement and fellowships. We'll hear from one of our former fellows and then our programme partners will talk to us about the partnered fellowships on offer. And then we'll have time for questions from you. Uh, the panel will be joined by um, our principal librarians to help respond to queries that you may have about the fellowships and about how fellows work with the state collection. So if you have a question, simply type in the hashtag SLV Fellows on the slider link on your screen. Feel free to add your question at any stage tonight. And you can also vote on questions that have already been asked that you're interested in. If the question's for a specific speaker, please indicate who it is, uh, but otherwise we will um, open the forum to answer your questions from the whole group. Our key aims for the Fellowships Programme are to showcase the library as a hub for creative activity and research, to foster and enable the creative use of the state collection, to create opportunities for the wider community to discover and access the library's collections through fellows work in progress and the outcomes of their fellowships, to contribute to cultural growth in Victoria, and to continue to support the creative and cultural sectors impacted so heavily by COVID-19. I'd like to hand over now to Susie, who'll brief you on some of the important dates, key considerations, and get the ball rolling to talk about the library's range of fellowships. Thanks, Shona. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Susie, a producer at the library and a member of the fellowships team. Um, as Shona said, I'm going to give you a quick overview of key Susie, dates. Susie, I can't hear you. I'm not sure if everybody else can hear you. Oh. Yes, thumbs up. Okay, sorry. Go oh. ahead. Sorry, everyone. So all good? Um, yeah, so I'm a member of the fellowships uh, team. So I'm going to give you a quick overview uh, of key dates, some important considerations, and I'll talk very briefly about the range of library fellowships. So I really hope this session is going to help you feel uh, encouraged, prepared, uh, and confident about submitting your application. 
Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the round opened on the 5th of August and closes at midnight on Sunday, the 5th of September. In this one month period, we're holding this general info night and an online info session specifically for the Indigenous Fellowships on Tuesday, the 24th of August. On Wednesday, 25th, we'll have a drop-in day. You can book in a private session with our production manager, Beck Anthony, our experience group administrative officer, Divya Das, and me to ask us questions directly on Zoom. Um, if you have any inquiries that aren't covered this evening, please email us at fellows at slv.vic.gov.au. And if you have any questions about the library collections, you can send an email via our Ask a Librarian service. And don't forget to check the guidelines and handy FAQs on the fellowships webpage. Once all applications are in, no later than midnight on Sunday, the 5th of September, the assessment and selection process will take place. Uh, assessors will be looking at your applications against the key criteria outlined on the library website for each fellowship type. Um, some of the key things assessors are looking for are projects that make significant use of and or contribute to the development of the collections of the library. It's really important that you state which collection area or which specific material you propose to use. Your list doesn't have to be exhaustive, but does need to demonstrate that you've engaged with the collection so that you've done your homework. Projects that demonstrate creativity and originality in use, interpretation or repurposing of the library collection will stand out. And showcasing your work to the public is important for us. Uh, some fellowships might result in a public facing outcome at the library, such as a display or a program. Um, decisions about programs and exhibitions are made separately. Uh, and so this isn't offered as a confirmed component of the fellowship being awarded. Successful applicants receive the grant, a space to work, a community of support, and during your residency, there will be opportunities to share your work in progress. However, in your application, we are interested to hear if you have an idea or plan for an outcome in whatever format you have in mind. These could be outcomes delivered during or after your fellowship. And you can have a look at some of the fellowship outcomes in the link to the fellowships um, gallery page. Do support your application with supplementary information, such as images, links to your website, if you have one, lists of articles or publications, examples of artwork, sound bites of your music, or anything else uh, that's relevant to your project and is going to help the selection panel get an insight into your work. Please let your referees know that we may call at some stage between 23rd of September and the 5th of October. Uh, successful applicants will be notified of the outcome in early November. And this information is strictly under embargo until the official announcement. Unsuccessful applicants will also be informed shortly after we've notified the successful applicants. And we'll contact the successful fellows to schedule either a morning or afternoon induction at the library in late November, early December. Uh, if you're not going to be available for an induction in this period, you're not eligible to apply. The available residency period is January to December 2022. Uh, we have informal gatherings planned for fellows to meet their liaison librarians. Um, I'll talk a bit more about them in a, in a second. And other support staff, as well as fellow fellows. And in May, as part of Melbourne Knowledge Week, we'll hold an open studio in the Dome Annulus to give the wider community an insight into the fellows' research and creative process. Um, next slide, please. So each fellowship recipient is allocated and supported during their residency 
by a designated liaison librarian. Uh, so I've got some images here of former fellows, um, hard at work with um, some library experts. And the liaison librarian's role is to introduce and link library fellows to the various services, collections and staff that who they, they'll be able to draw upon for their project. Part of the role will be to provide a regular friendly point of contact and to help ensure their fellowship is generally a happy and productive experience. Uh, next slide, please. So in the application form, we've included the eligibility questions in the first section to save you the time and effort of continuing in case you're not eligible. Um, you can also preview all the questions in the form uh, before you make a start. And there's a bit of a screen grab below there of the Smarty Grants form and the button for the preview. Um, it's really important that any fellowship applications that have an Indigenous focus or Indigenous content, uh, that it shows a connection to the Indigenous communities relevant to the project. So this could be either a letter of support from a member of the Indigenous community or a partnered or joint fellowship application with the person who identifies as Indigenous. Uh, next slide, please. So we have 16 fellowships on offering this round and we'll briefly talk through each of these. Uh, next slide. The library is offering two creative fellowships. So we invite recipients to be inspired by, repurpose, transform, or imaginatively respond to published or original sources in any way they choose. So applications are welcome from individuals or collaborative partnerships practicing in any art form and from writers and scholars in any discipline or subject. Fellows receive a grant of $15,000, access to a desk space in a shared office for 12 months and access to collections and staff expertise. Next slide, please. At the Children's Literature Fellowship encourages use of the library's children's book collection for a project exploring aspects of children's book publishing, writing or illustrating. Uh, the library's collection has over 100,000 items, including novels, illustrated fiction, picture books, graphic novels, poetry and traditional stories. And this fellowship also carries a grant of $15,000 and offers the same privileges as the creative fellowships. Next slide. The Berry Family Fellowship supports a project exploring an aspect of the social history of Melbourne or Victoria. Uh, this fellowship is biennial and commemorates the contribution of the Berry family to the cultural life of our state. And it also carries a grant of $15,000 and the same privileges as creative fellowships. Next slide. Uh, the Russell Beadles Performing Arts Fellowship is also biennial. It supports applicants wanting to utilise the library's collections on a project exploring theatre and the diversity of the performing arts in Victoria in all of its forms. Uh, the grant is also $15,000 and offers the same privileges as mentioned. Next slide. Two dedicated Indigenous fellowships are offered this year. The Indigenous Victorian Aboriginal Cultural Heritage Research Fellowship and the Indigenous Victorian Aboriginal Family History Fellowship. These are open to researchers who identify as Indigenous Victorian Aboriginal. They aim to increase Aboriginal Victorians' access to cultural knowledge held in the library's collection by supporting researchers to identify important items and produce research material to be used by the community. So the library's collection includes significant primary evidence of the interactions between settlers and Victoria's Aboriginal communities since colonisation. Uh, 
So each of these fellowships carries a grant of 15,000 and all the outlined privileges. Um, Indigenous fellows will be allocated desks in the offices closest to uh, our new Victorian Indigenous Research Centre. Uh, next slide. In association with Regional Arts Victoria, we're offering two Marion or Page Regional Fellowships available to applicants from regional Victoria to be inspired by, repurpose, transform, or imaginatively respond to published or original source material in any way they choose to create new work. Uh, next slide. And in addition to the Marion Orme Page Regional Fellowships, we're offering two more regional fellowships. The same criteria apply. All four regional fellowships carry grants of $15,000, the usual privileges. Um, and to be eligible, you do need to reside in regional or rural, rural Victoria. And there are handy links on our website and in the form, which include the list of 48 regional and rural local government areas. Uh, so that's it from me. Back to you, Shona. Thank you, Susie. I'd now like to ask Jo Tui, who is Executive Director and CEO at Regional Arts Victoria to join me for a chat. Um, Jo, um, we're so grateful to you for the ongoing advice and support for our fellowships program um, that you and your organisation give to the library um, because our range of regional fellowships are designed to support people from right across Victoria to participate in the program. And as Susie's pointed out, this year the library is offering four regional fellowships specifically designed for people whose work and practice takes place outside Melbourne. So, Joe, I'd love to ask you that as Regional Arts Victoria is an arts company that supports and, and inspires artists and practitioners from across the state, what would you like to say to encourage writers, scholars or creatives from rural and regional Victoria who might be thinking of applying for the fellowship programme? Thanks, um, Shona, and, and hello, everybody, and, and to all of the you of you in, in regional Victoria who are free, unlocked down uh, birds at the moment. Um, I hope you're in, in enjoying that. And, and my best wishes also to those of you based in the city who, who are not so fortunate right at the moment. Um, uh, in terms of encouraging people um, to apply, we know that about 24% of the Victorian population live in, in regional Victoria, but our experience has been that the, uh, the success rates and application rates for uh, most statewide funding programs are much lower than that. The, the last informational data that check that we did, it was closer to 8%. And so uh, some of the feedback we've had from regional Victorian artists and organisations is that they've often felt like programs like this uh, are not for them, or it, it's tricky for them, or they feel intimidated um, uh, putting themselves up against um, metropolitan peers, or they just uh, feel like the programs are uh, not suited in terms of their criteria and, and function to the way that they, they work in, in their communities. So um, this program is for you. And if I can, if I can say anything or emphasize anything with those regional uh, uh, applicants who are considering applying, this, this is not that. There are four opportunities here for, for you to apply for a program that is only open to regional uh, and rural Victoria. Um, and uh, it's a great credit to the to the state library to have uh, to be offering this, this support, this very targeted support uh, to support the work that you're doing uh, in your communities. Thank you, Joe. And do you have any uh, advice or thoughts for successful applicants in terms of thinking about how to balance? Uh, living, working, practicing in rural or regional Victoria, whilst also taking on a fellowship that is in some way sort of attached to a Melbourne library site? Yeah, uh, first of all, one, one of the uh, little bits of information that's provided on the, uh, the, the two different regional um, fellowships, of which there are two of both, um, is that there, there is an offer that the state library puts forward to connect you with, your, with local um, organisations, local libraries or, or local support. And if that's really important to you, I would really encourage you to take the, the State Library up on, on that offer and, and, and take advantage of that local support. So that, that's the first thing to think about. 
Um, the second thing is that we've all discovered in this um, lockdown period, um, the value of working remotely and, and working in person and, and in putting together your plan and, and how you might approach the fellowship. You need to think about what works for you uh, in person. What are the kind of activities that will work for, uh, for you to spend uh, time in the space? and what's gonna work with you working um, from home or at a, at a more local space and, and just plan around that. The question you asked Shona about balance is, balance is such a personal thing. And so for somebody living in Mildura uh, versus somebody living in Geelong, balance in terms of the amount of trips that you're gonna make into the city to attend space, uh, it's a very different proposition. Just like balance will be different for somebody uh, who's living with young children or somebody who's got other caring responsibilities. So consider balance to be a very personal and, and, uh, and adapt your project plan to meet your needs. Um, talk to the State Library team about your budget and what you might need to actually make your fellowship and project um, a reality. There's, there's a, um, a really good degree of flexibility of, of what kind of support can go from the fellowship to make your project possible. Um, and then finally, whatever your plan and, and whatever you're considering, um, I really would encourage you to uh, to take advantage of the space that is available at the amazing State Library. It is genuinely one of the best bits um, of the fellowship. So whatever your plan, just make sure that that visitation and that time in that space and, and that opportunity to meet the other um, fellows, um, whatever level and whatever balance you have to strike there, um, just build that, build that visitation into the plan because it's, uh, I can't speak highly enough of what a great experience it is to be in, in some of those spaces and, and around some of those other creative fellows. Thank you, Joe. It's really great to hear your perspectives. And thank you again to Regional Arts Victoria for the support um, that, uh, that you provide to the Fellowships Programme. Uh, now, at this point, unfortunately, I'm not able to have the conversation I was due to be having with Maxine Briggs, the Curie Librarian here at State Library, who's unfortunately not been able to join us this evening. But I do just want to reiterate that um, we're offering to um, research-based Indigenous Victorian Aboriginal Cultural Heritage research fellowships. Um, and, uh, and if you're interested in applying for one of those fellowships, please consider booking into the information session, which is scheduled for the 24th of August at 2 p.m., where there'll be some specific information around those fellowships and the support that those fellowships offer and how to apply for them. So we're now going to skip forward a couple of slides um, so that I can talk a little bit about our programme partners. Fantastic, thank you. Um, the beauty of the fellowship programme is that it draws interest from a really diverse range of individuals and every fellow's experience is different and every outcome is unique. Um, I would like to acknowledge that the fellowships program simply wouldn't be possible without the ongoing support from a range of very generous donors and supporters, including artist Ricka Moore, literary critic Morag Fraser AM, and establishments including the Balderson Press and Studio, the George Mora Foundation, the CJ Latrobe Society, and the University of Melbourne. The CJ Latrobe Society in association with State Library Victoria, awards a fellowship for the study of the colonial period of Victoria's history during Charles Joseph Latrobe's administration as superintendent and lieutenant governor between 1839 and 1854. I'm delighted to introduce Megan Anderson now, who will talk about her experience as the 2019 Latrobe Society Fellow. Welcome, Megan. Thanks, Shona. Thanks for having me. I'm going to read my traditional notes that I have on my piece of paper, not on the screen. Thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so the project idea that I had for my Latrobe Society Fellowship was to study his uniform. Um, so as far as we know, the uniform itself, the physicality of it doesn't exist anymore. Um, so as you can see on the screen, I was referring to this portrait by Sir Francis Grant as my starting point. Um, so we can get the rough outlines of what the uniform was, but clearly not much detail. So that was where my fellowship began. And luckily for me, this portrait actually hangs a few metres away from my office in the State Library. So we became very well acquainted in the time that I was there. So the State Library has 
a massive collection of material relating to um, Charles Joseph Latrobe. So I knew I was in the right place. Not only do they have the portrait, they have many papers and manuscripts and texts available to, um, that were available to me to do this comprehensive research that I was doing in relation to this uniform. I'm just gonna follow on from what Joe said about having that opportunity to be in the space. So I'm from Ballarat, so I am I do live regionally, um, but being a close connection to Melbourne, I was very lucky to be able to use my office as much as possible and meet other fellows. And that community of fellows was really important and integral to my experience as um, the Latrobe Fellow. There's a magical thing that happens when you're a fellow and you are doing research and you find the collection at the library so extensive and you order books online and then they're basically delivered straight to you so that was also a wonderful experience. I know when I packed up my office only a few months ago I still had piles of books um, lined up from pre-pandemic so it's kind of exciting being in the library and having those um, resources available to you. I also found um, being a fellow that other institutions with the backing of the State Library would were very generous with their information. So I spent some time um, researching some pieces at other um, local, as in Australia and other offshore institutions, and everybody was more than happy to provide me with as much information as they could, and they were excited about the project. Um, that, that excitement about history and creativity and the project I was doing was, it just spurred me on. It was wonderful. Um, and as so did my liaison librarian, Sarah. So I got to meet up with Sarah as often as I needed. Um, and she was there to support me and point me in the right direction of where I needed to go um, with what I was looking for. Um, we did find a couple of great finds that, um, solidified some of the research points that I was looking for. So Sarah was amazing with that. Um, being in conjunction with the Latrobe Society, I had the um, wonderful pleasure of being mentored by Diane Riley, one of their integral members there, um, and our relationship and her enthusiasm for my project was, again, it was the most wonderful experience to be able to share that with her and with them as a society. So having the backing of a third party was just a wonderful, wonderful experience for me. I felt completely supported. Um, and I think that's all I have to say. Thank you, Shona. It's a wonderful experience. Thank you, Megan. That's so wonderful to hear. Um, it's really, really, uh, it's really wonderful and rewarding to hear about uh, different fellows' individual experiences through the process of the fellowship. and. Um, and the ways in which they were able to have been able to explore their own research and creative practice. So thank you for giving us your reflections. Um, we'll pop to the next slide now because I want to speak briefly about the Redmond Barry Fellowship. So the Redmond Barry Fellowship is jointly sponsored by the Library and the University of Melbourne. And this um, research fellowship specifically makes use of the collections that are held at both institutions. So projects that highlight linkages between the collections and promote new insights on the subject, material, or collections held across both the university and the library are encouraged, as is the production of a digital creative or literary work that can be openly shared and potentially published in the university's repository. The archives and special collections at the University of Melbourne is one of the largest groups of collections at the university and sits within the university's scholarly services. It consists of rare books, prints, rare music, maps, the East Asian collection and the University of Melbourne archives themselves. And these are located at the university's Parkville campus, the Bailieu Library and the archive repository in East Brunswick and the university's collections are accessible by appointment. If you're applying for the Redmond Barry Fellowship and you'd like to get a sense of the university collections, then please do contact us via the fellowship mailbox 
and we can share information for the links for the catalogues and portals associated with the university's uh, collections in partnership with the university. The fellowships mailbox, which is fellows at slv.vic.gov.au, is listed on the various application materials and information. We'll move to the next slide, please. Now I would like to introduce Sylvie Glutter from the Balderson Press and Studio, who will speak about the Amour Residency and the Tate Adams Memorial Residency at the Press and Studio in St Andrews. I had the great pleasure of visiting the studio in St Andrews recently, and it really is a very uh, special place for creative work. Uh, so I highly recommend a visit. Um, over to you, Sylvie. Hi Shona, thanks very much. Um, I hope everyone can hear me properly. Um, so we're delighted to be part of the fellowship program again this year. Uh, I think from memory it's our sixth or seventh year uh, and uh, every year it's a, it's a wonderful experience for us as I'm sure it is for um, the uh, fellows who are able to work with us. Um, so I'm here on behalf of Balderson Studio my role is uh, studio manager. I coordinate uh, most of the activities as well as uh, teach. I'm also a practicing photo based artist and I produce my artwork in the studio. Um, Balderson uh, Studio is a not for profit incorporated association, which is run by a committee of management as well as a host of very dedicated volunteers. The studio is located in St Andrews. Uh, that's about 60 minutes northeast of Melbourne. We were founded in 2001. Um, so this is our 20th year. Next year we turn 21, uh, coming of age. <laughs> uh, so we were founded in 2001 in memory of the late George Balderson, who was a renowned Melbourne printmaker and sculptor. Uh, in the early 1970s, George and his wife Tess built uh, the stunning Bluestone Studio and it's from here that we run our printmaking activities. Our vision is to perpetuate George Balderson's generous and collaborative spirit by championing and supporting artists, particularly in all things printmaking. The studio is open to the public for creative use through a yearly program of workshops, residencies, masterclasses, events and regular studio access. Uh, we're open every day of the week just about. We're honoured and proud to be associated with State Library Victoria through the amazing Creative Fellowship Program. So uh, we have two residencies to announce tonight. Uh, firstly we have the uh, the Amor Residency at Balsam Press and Studio. Uh, this residency is with the generous support of the artist Rick Amor. This residency is offered to printmakers or artists who wish to deepen and enrich their printmaking practice using the extensive State Library Victoria collection as the starting point or inspiration for their project. Secondly, uh, we've got the Tate Adams Memorial Artist Book Residency at Balderson Press Studio. Uh, this one is generally sponsored by Morag Fraser uh, and it's for an artist to create an artist book using the facilities at Balderson Studio, as well as the State Library collection and resources. Both of these residencies are to the value of $5,000, $5,000 uh, each one. Now this is not a cash sum, but rather it can be used in a number of ways. It can be used for studio access. Uh, we can provide printmaking tuition, technical support. We can provide additioning uh, services. And we also have uh, beautiful on-site accommodation uh, for people wishing to retreat. Uh, we, re we recommend contacting us before you apply so you can propose a project and budget that best suits the idea that you have. Uh, please also research our website which has got plenty of information about the facilities and services that we offer. And for those of you who may not know, Tate Adams, we might want to move the slides along. <laughs> Sorry. Maybe I should have mentioned that earlier. Oh, well, you can see our space here um, and uh, we'll sort of go backwards. Um, that first slide, uh, two uh, uh, fellows that um, uh, did residencies uh, 2019 
were awarded it in 2019 and uh, then uh, spread the um, residencies over 2020 and 2021 due to uh, obvious reasons. Um, so the first one is Judith Martinez, um, who did the AMOL residency and the second image is of August Carpenter, who uh, is currently concluding her um, artist book uh, fellowship. Um, so just going back to uh, Tate Adams, uh, which is the last slide here. Um, he was a moving force behind the flourishing uh, Melbourne printmaking uh, scene, including George Balderson uh, in the 60s, 70s and 80s. And he passed away in the mid-2018 in mid, uh, and it's in his honour that we hold the, um, the, the Tate Adams Memorial Artist Book. Fellowship. Um, so at, at Baldwin Studio, we're equipped uh, for all forms of intaglio and relief uh, printmaking. We've got a very large motorised etching press, uh, three manual geared etching presses, and a 1864 Albion press, which is used for relief work. We also have extensive facilities for photogravure and photo based uh, printmaking. We can provide tuition in a number of print techniques uh, with very highly skilled teachers. The successful recipient also receives a state library liaison librarian and a dedicated space within the library for their research throughout the year. We encourage projects and creative endeavours relating to all aspects of printmaking and creative uh, bookmaking. This is the perfect residency for an artist where the riches of the state library collection and a space in the city can be combined with the retreat in our bushland studio, best of both worlds. Um, please note that you're welcome to apply for both residencies at once, uh, but you can only be awarded one. Uh, feel free to contact us via our website if you have any questions or you'd like some further information. We're very friendly and encouraging, so please um, get in touch. Thanks Shona, I hope that covers everything. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sylvie. Back to you. So tonight we also have Damien Hodgkinson, board member of the George Moore Foundation, who will now give us a little bit of insight into the George Moore Fellowship and the way that the foundation, the foundation supports fellowship recipients. Over to you, Damien. Shona, thank you. Good evening, everyone. And thanks for the opportunity to speak about the George Moore Fellowship this evening. We're delighted to be part of the State Library Victoria Fellowship Program again. And I know that our past fellows have uh, benefited greatly from access to the collection and the support of the librarians in the State Library Victoria. So to our, our fellowship, the George Moore Fellowship is awarded each year to a contemporary artist who's demonstrated excellence in their artistic field. The fellowship provides financial support residency opportunities and access to organisations and individuals with specialist knowledge to support the artist to research, experiment and create. Some form of public outcome is expected to culminate the fellowship. The fellowship is named after Georges Mora, an entrepreneur, restaurateur and art dealer, whose commitment to developing and promoting contemporary art saw him produce outstanding exhibition programs featuring local and international artists, including Charles Blackman, Arthur Boyd, Joy Hester, Sidney Nolan and more. George died in 1992. Today, the George Morrow Fellowship is awarded with funds generously donated by supporters and with the incredible support uh, resources of State Library Victoria. The purpose of this fellowship is to supply funds and access to resources for an artist to engage in fresh thinking and to research new possibilities in their art. In order to achieve this, the fellowship aims to provide maximum flexibility and autonomy to each chosen fellow in the use of resources of the State, of State Library Victoria and elsewhere and their presentation of the outcome of their research and interpretation. This fellowship is open to any Australian citizen or permanent resident who has a continuous commitment to the field of contemporary art. Artists at all stages of their career may apply and there is no age limit. Applicants who have previously applied to the George Murrow Fellowship must submit a new project proposal. For 2022, one fellowship is offered for a period of 12 months with a grant of $10,000. Uh, the successful fellow may choose to fulfil a residency uh, at State Library Victoria in full or part-time capacity and they have the freedom to undertake further residencies if desired. I might change the slide now. 
The selection process, applicants are shortlisted by the board of the Georges Moreau Fellowship. Uh, an independent panel of recognised arts and cultural professionals then award the fellowship. In selecting the fellow, consideration is given to the artist's past work, whether this work has demonstrated excellence in their artistic field, and if the proposed fellowship project will extend the boundaries of the artist's practice in new and significant ways. The George Murray Fellowship seeks an artist who has shown a continuous commitment to the field of contemporary art and who wishes to challenge their practice. Uh, applicants must submit a written application with supporting visual references. Applications must be submitted electronically. Uh, and selection criteria include standard of work, reason for applying, professional experience, and availability to undertake the fellowship. Just the last slide. The fellowship seeks to honour George Moore's legacy as a catalyst for growth by igniting courage and supporting fresh thinking in art. To date, there have been 12 fellowships granted to incredible artists, and we welcome your nomination to this group. For more information, you can visit the website, georgemorrowfellowship.org.au. Thanks, Shana. Thank you, Damien, that's wonderful. A heartfelt thanks again to our partners. These are all collaborations that the State Library is really very proud to play a part in, and they support a really dynamic, diverse and exciting fellowship program. So thank you again. I'd like to talk a little bit about how the selection process will work so that everyone has a picture of how that will roll out. All applications are assessed by a long list panel of assessors, and this includes a range of staff across the State Library with an external assessor from the University of Melbourne as well for the Redmond Barry Fellowship, which as we've described, um, works on both organisations collections. As Damien's just described, the George Mora Fellowship applications sit outside of the process with applications submitted directly to the foundation in order that the right expertise can come together to assess that particular fellowship. Assessors will look for the significant use of or contribution, contribution to the state collection and for original and creative use of the library collections. It's important in applying for a fellowship to describe your primary collection material and how you'll use it for your research or creative project. Shortlisted applications will then be reviewed by independent selection panels. The shortlist panels will comprise nine external committee members, so that's external to the library, who have specific expertise and specialist knowledge directly correlating with the types of fellowships on offer um, and the art forms subject matters that those fellowships address. So the external committee members represent expertise in children's literature, in regional arts practice, in visual and performing arts, in community cultural development, in writing, in literature, in Victorian history. The committee members will reflect the library's ultimate aim that we sense, foster a sense of belonging for all people, that we value people's differences, their unique backgrounds and their diverse experiences. The Indigenous Victorian Aboriginal Cultural Research Shortlist Committee will be chaired by Maxine Briggs and will include Indigenous cultural research specialists and individual partner-led shortlist committees for the George Mora Fellowship, for the Balderson Press and Studio Residencies, and for the Redmond Barry Fellowship, will include external and library representatives with the relevant expertise. So this process makes sure that um, all of the fellowships are, uh, applications are reviewed and assessed together with the right expertise coming into different fellowships at the right time and to make sure that that process is really equitable and robust. The final recommended fellowship awards are presented to the Library Board of Victoria for approval and shortly after that successful and unsuccessful candidates will be informed and we expect that to happen in October into November. Now, before we move to questions, I'd like to briefly talk about fellowship outcomes. And so we can pop to the next slide. Library fellows have contributed significantly to Victorian intellectual and cultural life with fellowship outcomes realized through activities at 
libraries, at cultural institutions, at universities, and at other sites of learning and creativity. Outcomes from fellowships have included publications, performances, artworks, exhibitions, public lectures and discussions. There will be a programme of public engagement and stakeholder events over the course of 2022 to showcase our fellowships. And during the residency period, there'll be an opportunity for fellows to share their work in progress with the wider public. And I'd really like to highlight the words in progress here, as we understand that projects take longer than a year to complete. And the purpose of the fellowships is to ensure space and time for research and creative exploration, not just to deliver an outcome within a set period of time. So for example, the 2017 Redmond Barry fellow, Luke Keogh's book, The Wardian Case, has recently been shortlisted for the New South Wales Prime Minister's Literary Award. And the 2016 creative fellow, Miles Allenson's novel, In Moonland, launched just this month. These are a couple of recent achievements by library fellows that have taken place after the residency at the library. So we congratulate all past fellows on the hard work that they undertook while they were with us and the continuation of their practice now and into the future. We're now going to move to Q&A. So thank you, Susie, Joe, Megan, Sylvie, Damien for speaking with us this evening. Um, and please all join me here on the Zoom stage. I'd also like to invite and welcome three of my colleagues who are going to join us at this point. So I'd like to welcome Tim Hogan, Principal Librarian, Victorian and Australian Collections, Kevin Malloy, Principal Librarian, Victorian and Australian Collections, and Des Cowley, Principal Librarian, History of the Book and Arts. Tim, Kevin and Des are joining us to help address questions that you might have about the collection um, and the role of the liaison librarians. Thank you to everyone who's putting questions in Slido and I'd like to remind you that you can add your questions to Slido and that you can also vote on questions that have already been asked um, if they're ones that you would love to have answered. There may be questions that we don't get to tonight and there may be questions that are quite specific and we'd like to give them a little bit more thought before responding to them fully. So in addition to having a discussion about some of these questions now, We'll capture everything that's been asked tonight and we'll provide follow up information. So we intend to provide some follow up responses to everyone who's attending tonight and with us, as well as incorporating responses into our frequently asked questions if there are some questions that are coming up again and again that we can help with extra information on. So now I'm going to turn my attention to Slido and have a look at what you've been asking and I can see that there's a number of questions here which is wonderful do keep asking away I'm gonna hop right to a question at the top of the list which is obviously something that's pressing for everybody um, which is due to the library being closed how can I reference and refer to books in my application without seeing them in person um, I have a response on this, but I might see um, if anyone else wants to put their hand up as well. Do do that if anyone would like to help them with a response. I think what's really important to say here is, although the library is unfortunately physically closed at the moment, library services and the support of librarians is available to everyone at all times. And there are a range of ways that you can find out about the collections, ask specific questions, uh, questions about our collections and seek support to research and understand our collections online. Uh, in the information um, on the fellowships part of our website, you'll be directed to the Ask a Librarian service, which is your first point of call if you want to find out more about the collection. And all of our librarians um, have been involved in different ways in the fellowship programme and if you contact um, the Ask a Librarian service and indicate that you're looking at applying for a fellowship, our librarians will be ready to help you remotely as much as they possibly can. We do of course recognise that due to lockdown, many people who would otherwise have been able to undertake 
a certain amount of research of collection in the building um, may not have been able to, and we will be taking that into account in the process of uh, long listing and short listing applications. But I do encourage you to use our Ask a Librarian service on the website where people will answer your questions and also help direct you to, to specialists and subject specialists who can help with your specific question or area of research. I hope that helps with that one. Now, the next question, which has had lots of votes, can you please share what the Creative Fellowship success rate is? Now, I think that what this question is asking is around, compared to a volume of applications, uh, how many people are successful? Um, we receive a high number of applications for the fellowship program. Um, it's usually in the hundreds across all of the fellowships that are on offer. Um, that number does fluctuate in different years. Um, it is a competitive process. Um, I think that I would struggle off the cuff to give a sense of what the sort of percentage success rate is, but to say that we do expect um, quite a significant um, amount of interest in, in the program, um, but I wouldn't want in any way for that to deter anybody from applying. Um, we always receive um, a large number of applications and it allows us to really look carefully at who would be in a great position to undertake a fellowship that year, but also ways that we can encourage people to think about reapplying in another year or working with the library in a different way. The next question, is this fellowship for established artists only? Susie, do you want to hop in and give a response on that? Absolutely. Uh, no, it's, it's all age groups. It's emerging and established. So yeah, not only for established um, writers or artists. Absolutely. Um, what, what I think that you, you'll see when you delve into the criteria is that the fellowships and, and different fellowships for different reasons are looking for a, a different amount of this. There is an expectation that you'll be able to demonstrate what your area of practice is, what your area of interest is, whether it's research or, or other creativity, um, and demonstrate work or thinking that you've done to date and where you would like this fellowship to take you. But the really important thing about the fellowships, which I think that we're all re we, we recognize is really valuable is this is exactly um, a way to achieve some space and time to undertake the development of a practice or area of work that you're passionate about. And it's buying that space and time that a fellowship um, gives you. So absolutely, um, fellowships are for people um, from a range of, with a range of experiences and backgrounds, but look carefully at the specific selection criteria for the fellowship that you're most interested in applying for, because some of the fellowships, because of their specific areas of interest or practice, will be looking for specific um, information within the application around work that you may have done or exploration that you um, may, have, uh, may have done. Um, to date. How will COVID lockdowns be treated in terms of, for example, extensions to the fellowship time limits? This is a really great, great question given the sort of ongoing uncertainty of the world in which we exist. Um, Susie, I wondered if you might want, or I can maybe just say a few words around the way that we managed um, helping the current fellows through the COVID uncertainty over the course of the last year in terms of access and extensions. Thanks, Shona. Uh, yes, well, firstly, um, we made sure that the liaison librarians and the 2019 fellows um, had um, were understood that they could communicate online um, and talk remotely about collections in their project. 
um, with each rolling lockdown, uh, we did um, work out extensions to make up for that um, lockdown period. So that was making sure uh, the fellows uh, were actually safe in terms of returning to their offices after a lockdown. Uh, so we did rearrange the offices so that each fellow um, had their own office um, just to make sure the density the density wasn't um, exceeded. Um, we they followed COVID rules, followed the QR codes, and also staff across the library were informed about the fellows being back in their offices in the period. Uh, so unfortunately, it had been a quite a difficult time for the 2019 fellows with the continued uh, extensions and then returning to their offices and then being locked out again. Um, but yes, we we still have some 2019 fellows uh, utilising their offices at the moment. Um, well, not right now, but when the lockdown lifts and also communicating with their liaison librarians and support staff um, online. Thank you, Susie. The, the, um, the last year I think has really demonstrated uh, and we've really been able to sort of bring to the fore that we want to make sure we're supporting everyone to be able to continue and see through the work that they really wanted to do in the best possible way um, whilst also trying to be fair and equitable to everybody through that process so it has been fantastic to be able to bring flexibility to how we've supported the 2019-20 fellows to wrap up uh, their term through the, the closure. Um, I have a collection specific question here, which we'll see if we can answer, but otherwise we'll capture for later, which is, is there a specific collection in which our um, photographs are usually kept? So for example, if somebody was looking for photographs from a particular period, how might they understand where those photographs are kept or how they could access them within the library collection? Tim. I, uh, I don't know, Kevin, Des, I'll take this one if you like. <laughs> I mean, the, the library has hundreds and hundreds of thousands of pictures and most of them are catalogued by sort of title and subject area. That's a, the pictures collections that are where it's an individual image. So it's a, a photograph or a negative or a painting or a drawing or a print. There are, there are of course many images uh, images within books and publications. That's a whole other different sort of stream of researching for images. And we can, you know, librarians here can assist people to identify those as well. But if you're talking about pictures as a format, then yes, they're, they're mostly catalogued um, and where, and by subject, title, place, a, a, a range of things. So there, there's lots of, you know, if you're interested in place or a period of time, there are ways to kind of do your searches to sort of uh, using the library catalogue to sort of zero in on on those particular themes or descriptions by place or, or theme or subject. And I guess, you know, talking to staff, seeking assistance, there's a pictures research guide. The library has a lot of research guides. You can look for research guides on from the homepage of the website. And there's one on how to do picture re research um, and that's a, a, a very good introduction to just how to do your general picture re research within the library. I mean you can always just talk to staff <laughs> and, and, and get your pointers that way that's you know we've got information services staff working across we're providing an information service right well not at this moment but you know <laughs> during business hours um, so even though we're, the, we're not in the building we're providing that service through um, you know, our reference and information service. And so I don't know, is, it, I, I hope that's answering the question to some extent. Um, that's great, uh, thank you, Tim. Kevin? I might, I might just, just hop in here, um, just to add to what Tim has said. The manuscripts collection um, are quite old multi-format collections. So there are, there are large pictorial components within the manuscripts collection. Some of those are, uh, the images are findable through a picture tab when you're doing your searching, but um, there are many other sort of albums and, and other 
sort of pictorial collections that uh, are embedded within the manuscripts collection. So um, do certainly search within manuscripts and um, by all means ask, um, you know, send in requests to, to, to ask about uh, particular themes you might be searching for and you know that can be you know we can we can search through that within the, the manuscripts collections yeah fantastic thank you kevin and thank you tim um there's a question here around references and i might see if um sylvia or damien might have something to say around this which is around um what what are, when when looking at fellowship applications what kinds of things are we looking for in a in a reference um, should it be somebody that an applicant has worked with um, no personally or needs to come from a wider area of practice or industry um, I wonder if either of you have any particular thoughts on what's most valuable in thinking about references sure I'll jump in um... Ideally, a reference who can speak to um, the experience and, and the work. So whether that's been a, a curator or a collaborator, um, a gallery director, someone who has um, first-hand experience of their practice uh, and, and how, uh, I, I guess, to, to comment or provide, um, yeah, to comment on the kind of gravitas that they have in their, in their career where they're up to. Someone they know. Thank you, Damien. Um, this question um, is, is quite popular and it's around, well, the question is how much detail are we ideally looking for in a project description? And I wonder if this is something that one of our principal librarians might want to comment on as people who really help think about um, looking at the applications and what people have applied for. Um, what's, a, what's a useful amount of detail in a project description? Um, I'm happy to say a few words. Um, I, th I think it's good to identify um, broadly the collections you're looking at. Um, and that could be a case of saying, I want to look at, you know, material in the manuscript collection, the pictorial collection, the, the newspaper collection. But within that, it's very good to define um, reasonably specifically what, what particular collections, for instance, in the manuscript you've identified from the catalogue, you may have consulted. Um, but it's fine just to, to identify and think that that would be a good collection. I think it's more the case of what what is not worth doing. I mean, occasionally I've seen applications that will list 227 book titles from the catalogue. That doesn't really kind of tell you a lot of information about, about the way you're approaching the project and the collections and the material in the library in a sense. So it doesn't need immense detail of everything you intend to look at. It just needs to kind of be enough there to really show and demonstrate that one, that the collection will really inform the project you're intending to do and you've done enough work to identify material in the collection that will actually produce that result. Thank you, Des, that's wonderful. A few people have asked whether or not you can apply for more than one fellowship. Uh, and if you're applying for more than one fellowship, whether or not these applications require unique answers to the questions or can repurpose the same application content across both. Uh, you can apply for more than one fellowship. I'm gonna to to throw to you Susie in a second. You can apply for more than one fellowship, uh, but each fellowship does have specific selection criteria and many of the fellowships do ask some different specific questions. And so whilst you can apply for more than one fellowship, we would really encourage you to make sure that you've written and um, presented a tailored response for the specific fellowship that addresses what that fellowship intent is um, and the specific uh, questions um, and specific selection criteria for that fellowship. There are guidelines around uh, on the website um, around applying, around applying for more than one fellowship and around the specific criteria that apply to different fellowships for you to take a look at. Um, so I hope that answers that question. I'll just see if Susie has anything else that she wants to add. Um, you've covered that really well, Shona. Um, 
just yeah just make sure you check the application questions because um that there are there's conditional formatting in the smarty grants form so yeah there's different there's some different questions for different fellowship types mm. And in Smarty Grants, when you select the fellowship that you're applying for, it then generates the right questions for that fellowship. Um, while I've got you, Susie, let's, uh, let's look, look at this question, which a few people have asked, which is, can we elaborate more on what's meant by planned public outcomes and what that could potentially look like? Um, I'm happy for you to jump in, or I've got a few things to say as well. Uh I kind of love the idea of someone coming up with a public outcome that we haven't seen before. <laughs> um, but yeah, all, part of the, if the fellowship, your fellowship research means that the outcome that you might state at the start might actually change a little bit, or you might think of other outcomes that might go along with the outcome that you planned initially, or some people come in with a very specific outcome and they deliver that outcome. So uh, yeah, planned, sometimes the plans change and that's absolutely fine. Um, uh, I, as in my producer role, I have worked with fellows who have um, public programs, public facing outcomes that they'd like to present, sometimes at the library, sometimes elsewhere. Um, and there's such an incredible range of public outcomes. We've had vaudeville circus shows at the library. We've had a fabulous um, uh, impromptu choir at the library using music from the library collection um, and just uh, all sorts of people coming to sing in the dome. Um, and then there's also, as Shona pointed out, publications that are outcomes. Yeah, so an enormous range of outcomes at the library. Oh, and Absolutely. elsewhere, and elsewhere. <laughs> Absolutely, so I think that it's really, it's really important to, as Susie said, there's a few different elements to this. Some of the fellowships are specifically designed to enable you to develop a piece of work or a research outcome or a creative outcome and that's part of, of and described within the fellowship that it's about progressing your work in a certain area um, there are lots of ways that the work you undertake in a fellowship could result in something that is a public outcome it could be about a, a, an activity a program a display an exhibition some of the things that Susie has mentioned but that doesn't necessarily need to be a requirement of that that fellowship and um, that could be something that happens further down the line. And then the other sort of element of the piece is that whilst successful fellows are undertaking their activity, we want to encourage opportunities for them to be able to showcase their work in progress as part of the library celebrating what it does. Um, and that's not about a sort of any fully formed piece of work. It's really about us being able to celebrate the fact that that space and time is being used for people's research and creativity. Um, the, the, I suppose a key thing to be aware of is that where there's a project proposal, fellowship application um, that, uh, that has um, suggested a particular public outcome at the library, that's really great if you can see an idea of what you think something could turn into, but that's a, that is a separate process. There's no guarantee that, um, let's say, for example, the development of an artwork means that that artwork is, is absolutely going to be displayed in a forthcoming library exhibition, let's say. Um, but you can absolutely identify the potential that you see that your work might have, um, because we do find that over the years, fellowship alumni are people who are showcased in our exhibitions, showcased in our other activity, and that's part of that natural and organic process around the community of practice around our collections that the fellowships are designed to support. Um, next question. Is the project that a fellowship applicant proposes supposed to be brand new or can it be an ongoing or existing project? Now, 
We have some specific information about this within our guidelines. Um, we do ask if you are already funded to undertake a particular piece of research or a particular creative project that you let us know that within the application. Um, and if you're working on a concept or an idea that has already started, that you let us know that in your application. But that isn't um, uh, necessarily a, a positive or a negative. It's really just to understand where you are in your area of practice and how this fellowship at this moment might assist you in con continuing that area of practice. So brand new ideas are as valuable as the continuation of an area of work or practice that you've already got evidenced, uh, evidence work in or evidence success in. Um, however, we do want to know where your idea sits within your own research or academic or creative journey at the point of this application so that we can understand what uh, transformative effect this fellowship opportunity might have for you and how that would be part of that story. Uh, I don't know if anyone else would like to add to that. Please feel free to pop your hand up if you would. Otherwise, I'll continue having a look. We've got lots of questions, which is great. Um, here's one that I'm going to ask Joe. Um, and we can, we can bounce this one back and forth together. So the question is, are there expectations around the minimum amount of time that a fellow should spend in the library if they are somebody who is typically based in rural or regional Victoria? Um, obviously, there'll be factors around distance and COVID here. Um, from the library point of view, I would say that I'll talk about the, the expectations piece separately, because I think there's two, two things here. I think at the library, we want to make sure that a fellowship recipient is supported to undertake the work that they want to undertake and can make really full use of the space, the expertise and access to the collections and building that the library can provide. But I think that this goes to this question of balance. And Joe, I wondered if you had anything else you wanted to add. Yes, um, in, in a practical sense, when you put together your application um, for the program, one of the questions is not how much time will you spend in, in the library. So in terms of what will come back out to the assessors in terms of how they how we're going to review, um, review the documents, um, it's you're not expected to necessarily have a, a detailed project plan of I'm going to be there every second Friday um, or anything like that. I think um, as well as the expectations from the library about the time, the time there. In my initial response, I guess my um, my thinking around it is um, how will you take uh, advantage of the opportunity that it, that being in the library um, presents, to you? and that's that's the way I get I guess to approach it. I think there are some collections that um, the library staff will be able to um, talk to in a little bit more detail that are actually only accessible. Um, in, in, in that space and the, the what you're going to get out of your creative outcome as the project delivers and what you're going to get out of being one of the state library's um, fellows is going to be more impactful for you if you have opportunities to be uh, to be in that space but if, if the, the very specific question about the actual funding application is I, I'm not going to be as as um or, or the assessors are not going to be looking through them and saying, well, this person's going to do 20 days in the library, this person's going to do 10, so we'll give it to the person who's going to do um, 20. It, it, it will be around the strength of your um, submission and your capacity to deliver on that, that will be the overriding um, drivers of, of what is ultimately successful for the, um, for the project. I don't think I'm speaking out of turn with any of that, Susie or Shona, but please correct me if I've got that wrong. I think you're absolutely right, Joe. And I wonder if that's, I think that's spot on. And I wonder if, um, to my librarian colleagues, are there any comments you'd like to make around, around that balance between the, the value of having a, a, a physical and in-person interaction with collection, but also how that can be balanced with working elsewhere? Um, maybe I'll... But um, Turner, look, I, I think Joe's articulated that wonderfully well, actually. I mean, it, I think it really depends on the collection material and the project itself. So there's no sort of hard and fast rule. Um, there's certainly tremendous benefit to be gained from spending 
uh, a good amount of time in the library. Uh, it'll be enriching and, and beneficial and it'll be fun. <laughs> so, you know, so I'd really encourage people to, you know, consider spending a, a reasonable amount of time, but it will really vary depending on what material they're using. Um, and, and, you know, some, you know, especially original pictures and manuscript material and some of the rare books, for example, you really need to be at the library and looking at it. And there's only one spot in the library you can actually look at it. <laughs> yeah, it's not just all around the library. Others, a material you might uh, initially really get a good pit, uh, idea of what you need to look at. And then you'll find that some of that material is accessible online or you can quickly extract information from it and then take it away and work with it. So it'll depend project to project. So that there's no hard and fast rule, but yeah, certainly there's a lot of benefit to be had from spending a, a reasonable portion of your time in the library. Wonderful, thank you, Tim. Susie? I've just got a, another thing to add about that. So yeah, that great points about um, access to the collection. Also no hard and fast rule. The residency period is the calendar year of 2022. One, one thing uh, potential fellows might want to keep in mind is uh, that it, it can be a bit of a beehive of like thinking and activity around the dome annulus. So if it, you might be paired up with uh, fellows that you might be able to bounce ideas off um, and just sort of getting to know the community, your cohort of fellows can be quite beneficial as well. Thank you, Susie. There's a question here which I don't know the answer to, and so I'm going to save it as one we'll try and answer offline, but it is quite popular, so I don't want to ignore it. And the question is, historically speaking, which fellowships are most or least competitive? The, the suite of fellowships that we have on offer does change year on year, um, and so there's probably not a useful direct comparison that can be made around the competitiveness of the different, or the, the, I guess the popularity or the level of interest around different fellowships. But we will have a look at whether or not there's anything useful that we can provide around the patterns and the way that people have applied for fellowships in the past that would be useful for current applicants. So we will have a look at that. Um, there's also a question here, which is, if you are a full time academic, can you apply? Now, I'd love to just encourage everyone to have a look at the fellowship guidelines, and I'm going to read directly from those um, guidelines just now. People who are uh, researchers, writers in various areas of practice are eligible to apply for the fellowship. But if you are an academic with access to paid study leave as part of your employment conditions or projects, supported by university derived funding for your research, you're not eligible for a fellowship. So do have a look at the eligibility guidelines on the website for that specific information around people who are on paid study leave or supported by an academic institution to undertake that study, not being eligible for a fellowship at the same time, and that should be useful. Did Megan have a question or an answer? Sorry, I've just seen a note. Megan, over to you. I just wanted to say in relation to the previous question about um, competitiveness. Um, once the applications had closed, I was actually very cheeky and I called and asked how many people had applied for the La Trobe Society Fellowship. So like no extra information, but I just knew roughly my potential chances. So that's kind of a cheeky thing that I did. Thank you, Megan. Great stuff. And um, here's a question which, uh, which, and I'm keeping an eye on time, we've got just under 10 minutes left. So any burning questions or burning boats, get them in now. Uh, this is one that our um, uh, principal librarians might want to address, which is in an application, is it better to identify only a few materials or is a project that draws on a broad but specific range of materials also attractive? Anyone want to jump in? Um, I, I, <laughs> I was just going to say, I think it can, can be both. And, and it's a bit 
going to the heart of what I was saying before. I mean, you can, yeah, I mean, we do get projects that are very broad and use every part of the collection and that's okay, particularly creative projects, which might scatter gun right around looking for things. The other thing to keep in mind is that, is that you will discover things on the way. You might begin with a list of what you think is going to help your project. And as you get into it, you're going to discover a whole lot more and it's going to drift and change like any research. Um, and a bit following on from what I said before, um, within the application, when you're citing, it's a case of, you know, not too little, not too much. And, and as I said, I mean, you know, when you see an application that just mentions broad categories, like I'm going to look at maps and newspapers and manuscripts and pictures, that doesn't tell us anything. Um, but, but as I said, neither do you want a, a scholarly bibliography of 16 pages citing every single work, because that's just too specific in a way. And, and we're not looking for that level of detail, but we want to see that the applicant has an understanding of what's in the collection, has some understanding of the strengths of the collection. Um, you know, if you're saying you want to look at maps, it, it's, it's good to say I'm looking at maps for particular regional areas between 1860 and 1900, and then perhaps even identifying so that such as parish maps. You show you've got an understanding of what we actually hold without going down and then listing the 480 maps that sit in that category. Um, Tim, did you want to add something there? Oh, just exactly along those lines. Yeah, I, I think you just need to identify enough things that would tell us about, to a degree, how your project or your work will be informed. You, we need a bit of a dive in with some some specific references is good, but it doesn't need to be all that many, I don't think, but just some specific examples. Yeah, and please, exactly, just avoid, we see a lot of applications that say, I'm going to look at maps and history books, or I'm going to look at some old diaries, or I'm going to look at Plenty of lots old photos. So let's please sort of just, um, you know, explore a little bit more before you put your application together, seek the help from staff, use the research guides, and and you will, we fully expect you'll find more along the way, as Des said. Um, but we need to know a little bit about what you have in mind and and have some assurance that you've you've already made a bit of a start. Um, you know, so it's enough enough to sort of give us an inkling of the creative use of our collections. Wonderful. Thank you, Des and Tim. Megan, did you have your hand up? Go for I, it. I just wanted to add that with Smarty Grants, um, every section of the application has a word limit. So you, you've got limited space. So what I did was I had to tailor my um, all of my responses to fit into those spaces. So it actually was quite a long process of the application. But when there is that question and they're asking about the resources that you're going to use, I think it's something like 750 words at the time that I did it. Um, and I was looking at a lot of items of the collection. So I did have to reduce the words that I had to put in there. So that's part of um, the application process as well. Fantastic, thank you, Megan. Um, a couple of uh, questions I'll just quickly respond to while we um, come to the end of our time. Um, a couple of people ha have asked about, um, again, how, how people can access and understand the collections from home um, if we don't currently have access to the library site. So once again, and we'll make sure that this is clearly addressed in our frequently asked questions, um, you can um, you can reach our librarians for um, general um, support and specialist support through the Ask a Librarian service, and our librarians will really help to direct you and support you in understanding and being able to explore digitised collections where possible, and will also help you to understand what the options are for understanding non-digitised collections that aren't available online. But we will make sure that we can um, that we can uh, give make sure that that's covered off in the frequently asked questions because we. We want to make sure that people understand how they can understand and use library collections, particularly at the moment, while we um, don't have access to the site. Um, a couple of questions have been asked around the correlation between a fellowship um, and the library having a first right of publication or access to the results of that research or creative endeavour. Um, I'm not going to go into this in detail now. There's not, an, uh, there's not a direct link between the library having first right of access to something that a fellow develops or produces. There are expectations within the agreement with successful fellows around how 
the library's fellowship will be acknowledged in subsequent published work or other outcomes. Um, and some of the fellowships have got uh, specific support around a developed outcome um, as a result of that fellowship. So it's a little bit different for different fellowships. So what I'm going to do with that one is make sure that we provide a little bit more information um, in the follow up to this session, but also in the frequently asked questions. So that's around the correlation between a fellow undertaking work and the library having a first right of access to that work or how that or how that works. Um, so I'll put together some information about that for everyone and for all applicants because it can be a little bit um, complex. Um, another question that's been asked is whether or not, again, you need to be an established researcher, whether or not you already have to have a degree or a master's degree or a PhD to apply. No, you don't. So everyone's eligible to apply. You don't need to already have specific academic qualifications in order to apply. Um, we're coming to the end of this session, and I do want to do two things. First of all, I want to see whether or not any of my co-panelists have anything that they would like to add or comment on as a final word of support at this point, other than the generalized support that I think that we provide to everyone who's here today who's interested in applying for a fellowship. Nope, everyone seems happy, that's great. I think, uh, Shona, I'd just like to tell people when they're, when they're looking for collection material, read the catalogue record carefully. Quite often there are links, you know, there are descriptive lists um, attached. There are sections that say there are descriptive lists that are available that, that you can then sort of ask for. So, you know, just when you're looking, look carefully, um, cover all bases and um, but particularly you know, do understand what it is you're looking at when you're reading a catalogue record. Yeah. That's great. Thank you, Kevin. Megan? Sorry. <laughs> um, I did just want to add, because it came up twice, um, that not being able to access the library at the moment with lockdown, um, I actually did my complete application using the website. The website is amazing. You can find pretty much everything you need to find. I don't even think I contacted a librarian. I just trolled and trolled through the website. So I spent a lot of time doing it. It took me three months to write my application. So not to scare anyone off, but that was me. Um, but the website's amazing. And yeah, everything that I needed was on there. Thank you. Thank you, Megan, and thank you, Kevin, for that, that additional point. Yeah, that's that's really valuable. Susie? Just one final reminder that if you still have questions after this session, uh, we've got quite a few avenues for you to ask those. So the fellows at slv.bit.gov.au um, email address. And also, if you want to have a chat to um, me, Divya and Beck, on Zoom, there's still a few spaces left for one on one on three discussions. Fantastic, thank you, Susie. Um, thank you, everyone, for your questions. I'm sorry there are a number of questions. There have been a lot of questions, which is fantastic, and there are quite a few that we didn't get to. Um, but as I say, I am going to um, work with the team to provide responses to those questions, integrate responses into our frequently asked questions, make sure that we've provided other uh, support and direction to help everybody with their application. So thank you, everyone for attending this session uh, and for asking these questions and for your interest in the fellowship program. We really appreciate you being here tonight and I really hope that you're enticed to apply. I also want to once again thank uh, the fellowship um, supporters, partners, other organisations and my colleagues who've joined me here today to provide such an um, interesting and valuable range of perspectives on what is a really um, varied and dynamic and complex program that provides a whole range of opportunities for people to work um, with the state collection and pursue their own research, academic or creative practice. So thank you to my co-panelists and very special thanks to our two Auslan interpreters for being here tonight and, uh, and managing to, um, to provide that interpretation support throughout this session, thank you. So that brings us to the end of the session. Best of luck everyone with your applications. 
take care of yourselves and those around you in these challenging times. We hope to see you at the State Library soon. Thank you.